What's up, y'all? It's Johans. I want to tell you about a podcast that means a whole lot to me. It's called Somebody, and it's from the same crew who worked with me on You Didn't See Nothing. The show's narrated by my friend, Shapiro Wells. In 2016, Shapiro's son, Courtney, was found outside a Chicago police station with a bullet in his back. May he rest in peace. Shapiro from the gate doesn't trust what the police are telling her. So she launches an investigation of her own. It's deep. It's full of some amazing twists, some wild turns. And if you like You Didn't See Nothing, you're going to want to listen to this one too. Trust me. Go to your podcast app right now and search somebody. It's a little blue and red image. But enough from me. Here's Shapiro. When my son Courtney was 21 years old, he got a BMW convertible. He loved that car like it was his girlfriend. He would talk to it like, good morning, hello, baby. Buenos dias, baby, buenos dias, como estas, mi amor? The first time Bebe rolled into our driveway, it was late at night. Courtney and his drop top BMW. Courtney had the music blasting all the way up. You did it! It's like like a little block party, you know, in the middle of my driveway. He had the top down. It wasn't even that hot outside, but of course he had the top down. It was a beautiful moment, and that was probably one of the most happiest moments I've seen him. Twenty-five ten, Robert. Twenty-five ten, Robert. 25. Just got flagged down at Granite Central. A gentleman just said he was shot. Okay, we'll get EMS rolling to the twenty-fifth district. Oh, okay. Oh. Yes, yeah, send an ambulance right away. But not even one year later. My son wound up with a bullet in his back outside a Chicago police station. And there are still so many unanswered questions about what led to the death of 22-year-old Courtney Copeland. Family members say Copeland was on his way to a friend's house when he was shot through his car window. A bullet hit his back. He managed to flag down a police car in front of the 25th District Station and was rushed to a hospital. The wound was fatal. There's what you hear on the news. That Courtney got shot, drove himself to a police station, where officers did everything they could to help him. His mother's heart tonight left in pieces. And then there's the truth. I believe that not enough has been done to solve Courtney's murder. What would you like what would you like done that I haven't done? I personally would have went back and re-interviewed everybody to make sure that we re-interviewed the police. Oh, absolutely. My name is Shapiro Wells. I'm Courtney Copeland's mom. And this is Somebody. Everybody, somebody's every day. Nobody's nothing. Oh, nobody. That's right. Chicago police have one of the lowest murder solve rates in the country. And it's even lower if you're black. So when it came time to find out who killed my son, I knew I'd have to figure it out on my own. I'm going to take you with me step by step in my investigation. But first... Let me tell you about my son. You need to know who he was in life because we're going to spend a lot of time talking about his death. Courtney was born a day after my 21st birthday on New Year's Eve, 1993. And I just still remember him sleeping on my chest sometimes. You know? That's my mom, Renee. Right, and his favorite thing was warm milk. And he talked about that until an adult. Grandma, I still remember the warm milk you would give me when I was a baby. And I just thought that was so sweet. 
What do you remember about the early years? He would have like little jokes and stuff. Here's my husband, Brent, um, Courtney's father. He's raised him since he was four years old. You know, like, in fact, like the first joke he had told me, he was like, what do you call uh, stolen cheese? I said, what? He said, nacho cheese. I'm like, oh, I'm like, it was kind of corny, but it was still funny at the same time. He had, he had a million have, of those. Y'all both have cornball <laughs> and yeah. jokes. That's right why y'all got along. Yeah. Next. Here he is goofing off with some of his friends. Hey, how you doing today? What's your name? Courtney Copeland. Courtney's oh, pretending to be a contestant on American Idol. He's in the seventh grade, right at the age where his voice is changing. Don't make sense right now, but it will. Never sounds so good. How to make it fail. Oh. Congratulations, Courtney oh, thank Copeland. thank you, Woo! I'm going to Hollywood, baby! Courtney sure knew how to turn on the charm to get what he wanted. And Courtney was kind of a manipulator with you. You know, it was like uh, he'd ask me for $20 and then turn around right. and ask you for $20. $20. Yes. And then he was asking Kim for, for $20, $20 and now yes. he got $60. He's got $60. That's how he would do it. And I, and I wish I could do it for him now. <laughs> Courtney was energetic and outgoing. I mean, he was so handsome. He had this caramel colored skin and the most incredible smile. He spent all his money, and I mean, all his money on food, clothes, haircuts, and shoes. My mom just came back from Wisconsin. She bought me this hat. Say Gucci. Gucci boy. After Courtney died, I went through his phone. Look at Uncle Courtney. All those videos and photos and social Ooh, media. Your boy. It made me feel like he was still right there with me. Really, we called him Gucci in high school. I don't know if it was because he was flea or because he looked like Gucci Mane, but we just, we called him Gucci. One of his friends was a kid named Chancellor Bennett. You might know this guy as yep. Chance the Rapper. I got suspended, ooh, you got suspended for chief and a hundred blunts, 14, 400 minutes. Fans on in the stands, they hands for Mr. Bennett, that racket over the But yeah, I met Gucci when I was like in summer school, you know what I'm saying? Not to, I, and I, I don't hope, I hope that doesn't have like a negative connotation and stuff. But like, I mean, I was in summer school. Everybody goes to summer school. So yeah, he would freestyle with me. We would, you know, kick it after, after school and stuff and just be rapping, walking down the street and beatboxing and stuff like that. Courtney would always tell me, mom, this guy is going to be huge. That was like a thing at the time. Like I was passing out CDs, like I was burning CDs and like standing outside of Columbia. He would be standing out there with me or like he would take CDs and from me, and give them to other people and stuff, too. They went to Jones College Prep. It's one of the top public schools in Chicago. Courtney played on the basketball team, and he helped them win a city championship. When he was 17 or 18, he got a tattoo of a basketball across his chest, and it says, Ball to I Fall. I've always hated tattoos because I'm a religious person, and I believe tattoos are a desecration of the body. When I first saw the tattoo, I literally cried. And I said, you just want to hurt your mama, don't you? Then he got more tattoos, including one that says, Mama's Boy. How do you like that? Courtney got a partial scholarship to play ball in Indiana but we could only afford to help him so much. So he had to come back home after one semester. He got a job as a janitor and at Dunkin' Donuts. Gotta get ready for work. Oh my God. Put on my pants, put on my shoes, put on my shirt, ready for work. He was wandering through life until a friend recruited him into the business called World Ventures. Courtney's job was to sign up members for discount vacations all over the world. Courtney was determined to go to the top. And that's when I really saw Courtney turning into a man. That's my mom again. Because of his positive mental attitude that he developed, his change of thinking, how people treated him. He became more of a leader now. In just one year, Courtney signed up so many people. The company helped him lease that BMW as a bonus. It is World Ventures Wings and Wheels. <laughs> Step one, get your wings. 
Step two, get your wheels. Courtney asked me if I would sign for the car for him, and I told him no way. If he wanted to get someone else to help him, that was on him. So he convinced his friend Christian Hernandez to co-sign. For Courtney, the BMW was validation. And we all loved that car. His cousin Sean, who's a rapper, used it in his music video. I'm addicted to the money, I'm addicted to these hoes, I'm addicted to this cash, all I know is count that dog, count that dog, count that dog. You know, it was just like a typical rap video, sexy girls dancing all around and the guys and money and Courtney's in the video too. Courtney was living the high life. Just a few months before he died, he went on a trip to Cancun. I'm supposed to be at Dunkin' Donuts right now, but psych, I did something different. I say yes, I stay consistent, I work hard. I mean, I this was a trip yes. of a lifetime. He was just like he was on top of the world. Hey, Macarena! He did the Macarena in the hotel lobby. He went scuba diving. You ready to get started? <laughs> rode a jet ski. He was doing really, really well getting close to moving out my basement and moving in with some friends. Here's what I know about the last day of my son's life. Courtney helped a friend move a sofa. He talked to my mom about becoming an in-home caregiver. The application was due the next day. That day, I remember I got my hair done. And that night, I caught some of the Republican presidential debates. Ever hit my hands? I've never heard of this one. Look at those hands. Are they small hands? (laughs) While I was watching that, Courtney was given a presentation for World Ventures. Around midnight, Courtney swung by Pizons, his favorite pizza place. It's a couple of blocks from our house in Cicero, just outside of Chicago. And he ran into his friend, Chris. The next day, we were supposed to go on a little road trip. We were going to be there for the weekend. So we were preparing everything. Courtney showed Chris this book he was reading. It was called Think and Grow Rich. He was already on Chapter 3. I always tell people this story because it felt weird because he left the parking lot right from Pizons, and I didn't even get in my car yet. You know, usually I say bye to somebody, I'll get in my car, and I go. But I stood outside, and I'm like, man, that's crazy. You know, he hit the bonus with the car. Like, he's happy. He's reading that book. But Courtney really wasn't headed home. It turns out he had this girlfriend, a co-worker he was dating, and he was heading to see her. I replayed this night so many times in my head. I wish I had texted him like I usually would do to see when he'd be back home. Maybe then he would have just come back to the house. I don't know why I didn't check on him that night. I'm excited, man. Reason why is because, you know, I understand that I'm God's highest form of creation. Before he drove into the city, Courtney posted on Snapchat. He's in his car wearing a red hoodie under his peacoat. He looks so happy and hopeful. The things that I want and obtain in my life, I can do them. I just got to believe in myself. His name on Snapchat was Born Leader 34. 34 was Courtney's favorite number. And the night he died was March 4th, 3-4. An hour after he posted on Snapchat, my son was being rushed to the hospital. I am calling because I just received a patient here to our ER. Um, The hospital called the police in Cicero, where I live. Okay. And um, what's the name of this gentleman? His name is Courtney Copeland, C-O-P-E-L-A-N-D. And you want his mom advised that he's in the hospital? Yes. He was actually en route to, I guess, a police station nearby because he had been shot, and then he came in by ambulance. 
I don't know if you want to tell her what the nature of the injury is yet. Nah, probably not. I probably don't want to. Just that he's injured in the hospital. A little after 2 o'clock in the morning, the Cicero police came bamming on our door. When I opened the door, he asked me, did I know a Courtney Copeland? I was already thinking that this is bad. The police told us that Courtney was in the hospital in Chicago, and that's it. And at that point, she probably remember you dropping to your knees. Say, Mom, I know he's dead. I know he's gone. They just don't do this. They don't, they know this is when someone's dead. I assumed that it had to be some type of uh, auto accident because Courtney was always known for texting and driving. I remember my husband, Brent, driving our family to Illinois Masonic Hospital. My mom, Courtney's sisters, my aunt, we were all there. We rolled in our town and country minivan, and it was in the middle of the night. And I don't even recall any other cars being on the road. Right away, the staff wanted to take us to the family room. But I knew, I knew what the family room was. So when they tell you that your kid is dead and I didn't want to go they sent in this nurse a very kind nurse she stayed with me she held my hand to try to keep me calm I had no idea then how important she would become to my investigation that's when The doctor came out and told us the news, you know, that he had died from a gunshot wound. And we were like, well, why, why, what do you mean a gunshot wound? Who shot him? When the doctor said my Courtney was shot, that was like an unbelievable, we didn't hear anything else. Everybody drops to the floor screaming, yelling. Okay, oh no, oh no, oh no, because that was the last thing that we would think Courtney would be involved in is any form of shooting because he was not that type of individual, okay? And he was a nonviolent person. He would, you know, he would not be involved in anyone that would have guns. The doctor told us that when Courtney arrived, they opened up his chest to try to save him. I'd been at the hospital for over an hour, and I still hadn't seen my son. And you know, as a mother, you want to have that confirmation that this is indeed your child. They told me I couldn't see him until detectives got there. And I told them, I said, well, I'm going to tell you right now. If I can't see my son, I'm going to tear this whole hospital up. They finally let us see Courtney. He was on a hospital bed in the trauma unit. After a few moments, I asked everyone to leave. Because I had to be with him. I had to be with him by myself. I began to touch him. His body was still warm. I caressed his face and kissed his forehead. And I told him, I was like, I'm sorry I wasn't there for you. When you needed me the most. And I walked out of the room. And then it really hit me. That Courtney was gone. And I just collapsed. Courtney's friends and our extended family were piling into the hospital waiting room. 
I remember two detectives coming in. They were white and middle-aged, and they told us what they knew. They said Courtney was shot in his car and drove himself to the police station. Courtney jumped out of his car and flagged down an officer for help. But the car was still moving, so the officer told him to put it in park. So Courtney hopped back into the car and put the car in park. And then they said that Courtney ran over to the officer again and grabbed his arm and said, I've been shot before collapsing. Then came the moment when I felt something more than grief. I felt suspicious. See, the detective said they wanted to ask me some questions. In their first one, they asked me if Courtney was the owner of the BMW. Remember when I told you that Courtney had to get a co-signer for the car? Christian Hernandez. Christian's name was actually on the registration and not Courtney's. Courtney had been stopped before because of this. So when the police asked me if he was the real owner of the car, I started to think, maybe this was a police stop gone wrong. You know, like Philando Castile up in Minnesota. Maybe the police stopped him after running his plates and seeing a black man driving a car registered in a Hispanic man's name. The first thing that Courtney's friends did is went looking for clues. They went to Belmont Cragen, the neighborhood where Courtney was shot. They saw skid marks and some broken glass on this corner near a Catholic church. They scooped up the glass and talked to a neighbor who said she heard gunshots. We put up reward posters all over the neighborhood. So we went with the flyers, and, and we were on the radio. There's anybody that can help us get answers. First, we offered a $5,000 reward, then a $6,000, then a $6,600. In the end, we put up $10,000, but we got no answers. We tried to keep Courtney's story alive in the news. Here I am on a local show called Jamaica Funk. Fit the mold. Give us a little background of Courtney. What 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 did Courtney do? Courtney was a senior sales rep at World Ventures uh, Travel uh, Industry, and he was a rising member of the uh, of the Chicagoland area. So he had. I wasn't just trying to solve his case. I was also fighting to protect his name. Police say Copeland was not a gang member. They can only guess right now why he was shot. He graduated from Police said he wasn't a gang member? Why was that even a question? I had to do everything I could to protect his image. When reporters asked to use photos of him, I made sure he looked his best. So, so I, just, I just don't want the narrative to be negative about my son because, because he was not that... that. That's my biggest fear. Okay, so you prefer we use the picture of him in the tux. That's yes. on his Facebook yes. page. Yes. Whoever did this to my son, I ask that you turn yourself in. I ask that you ask for forgiveness from God. Looking back at my face on TV that night he died, it's literally hard to believe that was even me. How many kids have to die? How many black children? I have to die in Chicago. I remember being in so much pain, but I needed to find answers. That was the only way I knew how to keep going. A few people did come forward with tips. One guy actually told me he was driving by the police station and saw Courtney on the ground with cops just standing around him. This bystander basically told me when he looked at the scene, he felt that the police were doing something to him. And then when I began to press him, trying to get more information, 
And that's when he was like, you know, I don't really want to get involved. You know, you don't understand the police around here. They'll come after me. And then he finally told me, he was like, look, I have children and I can't risk my life to basically tell you what I saw. Then there was a tow truck driver. He took a video. It's hard to make out, but it looks like Courtney is laying on the ground outside the police station. The lights are flashing and no one is helping him. One of Courtney's friends, a World Venture guy named June, says he got in touch with the tow truck driver. I mean, his theory, the guy in the tow truck says his theory was that the police did it. That was, that's the first thing that came out of his mind. That's what he's been saying since the beginning. What the police told me is that they did everything they could to save him. But you know what? It just wasn't adding up. So I said to myself, I just got to bury my baby and lay him to rest. And then I'll find out what really happened. I needed some strength. So I turned to Courtney the only way I could. Any obstacle, you know, that you're going through within your life today, understand that God will never put you through anything that you cannot handle. The reason why they call it a pass is because you already went through. Remember how I told you that since Courtney's death, I go through his phone? Guess how he had me listed? Uh-oh. With three exclamation points. As in, uh-oh, my mom's calling. And you know what? He was right to be afraid. Because when I get onto something... I don't let up. And I'm putting the police on blast right now. I will find out the truth of what happened to my son. And when I do, the whole world will know it. Everybody, somebody's every day. Nobody's nothing. Oh, nobody. That's right. Somebody is a co-production of The Invisible Institute, The Intercept, Topic Studios, and iHeartRadio in association with Tenderfoot TV. I'm Shapiro Wells. This podcast is produced by Allison Flowers and Bill Healy. Sarah Geis is our story editor. Ellen Glover is our associate producer. For The Invisible Institute, Jamie Calvin is executive producer. For Topic Studios... Maria Zuckerman, Christy Gressman, and Letal Malad are executive producers. Special thanks to Lizzie Jacobs. For The Intercept, Roger Hodge, deputy editor, is supervising producer. Sound design by Carl Scott and Bart Warshaw. Michael Rayfield is our mix engineer. Our theme song, Everybody's Something, is by Chance the Rapper. Original music for the podcast by Nate Fox of The Social Experiment and Eric Butler. Additional reporting by Sam Stecklow, Annie Wynn, Kahari Blackburn, Rajiv Sinclair, Henry Adams, Matilda Voyat, Dana Brozos Kelleher, Francis McDonald, Diana Akmajian, Maddie Anderson, Andrew Fan, and Erissa Apentaku. Translation support by Benny Hernandez Ocampo and Emma Perez. Fact checking by Nawal Arjeni. Special thanks to Chris Rasmussen. Bennett Epstein, Matt Topic, David Brelo, and Julie Wolf. We want to hear from you. Email us at info at somebodypodcast.com or leave us a voicemail at 773-270-0121. To learn more about this case and for links to additional materials, go to our show page at somebodypodcast.com. You can also find a list of everyone we want to thank there. So many people helped us along the way.